what would the soundtrack be for the prodigal son to come back home? Uh, and I think it should be fun. And I also think the the table of God, when you talk about the table of God, it's always open. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 145 of the Between You and Me podcast. It's a new season. We started last week with Mike Donaghy and the momentum is still rolling because this week we are talking to the one and only Jimmy Cravity. Now, context for all you newcomers, just, you know, hoping, assuming you're there, Between You and Me is a podcast where we talk to music makers about the things that hurt, heal and change us in church culture. The idea is we all have our own stories, right? And more often than not, There's stuff that we go through that we don't really want to tell anyone else, especially if you're in Christian music, probably because it's not sellable or culturally we just, we've been taught to hide it or dig it or push it down. But if we actually share our stories, our struggles, our victories, our hopes, the stories behind the songs, maybe we will find common grounds. Maybe we could all sit at the table of God and realize we all have a place there, even if we are different and have different stories. That is why this podcast exists. And we do it with a great soundtrack because every week we talk to an amazing musician, various genres, various levels of commercial success, who has a story to tell. And today is no different. Like I said, we're talking to Jimmy Cravity. Now, if you haven't met Jimmy Cravity, you are missing out, my friends, because this is a man who is so well loved and respected in both the secular and the Christian music industries. That is only only a handful of artists can do that. Jimmy Cravity is one of them. He's worked with people like Usher and Jay-Z and Rihanna. At the same time, he's worked with Matt Redman and Governor B. His single with Tasha Cobbs Leonard went to number one. Like, But he's also had other number one albums with other artists. Meanwhile, he also releases his own music, which is why we are chatting with him today. Jimmy Cravity from Atlanta, Georgia, has just released his his album The Last Amen. It's a worship record and I was so curious of all the genres, of all the industries and audiences that Jimmy Cravity could have chosen, why did he choose Christian music and why a worship record? His answer is so interesting and I loved hearing his heart for people both in and outside of the church. It was really cool. I am not going to dance circles around this too much, I would love for you to meet Jimmy Cravity and hear about his album, The Last Amen. You're about to hear a short bio, the who, what, when, where, why, who of Jimmy Cravity, just to give you some context. And then we're going to dive straight into this interview and you will hear some amazing tracks from The Last Amen along the way. Friends, meet Jimmy Cravity. Jimmy Cravity is a musical shapeshifter, an artist, songwriter, record producer, multi-instrumentalist, label owner, worship leader and fashion designer. Jimmy is as comfortable performing his own music as he is co-writing with a gospel artist or a hip-hop icon. And that's not an exaggeration to say he's a chameleon, adapting his gift to serve God wherever he finds his feet. Jimmy has written for Face City Music, Tim Bowman Jr., Michelle Williams, Alien Ant Farm, Ludacris, Usher, Passion, Tadashi, Brent Fayez, Jack Ross, Nori, Brian Kennedy, Governor B, Matt Redman, Jason Ingram, and 116. There's a chance you may have also heard his work on Netflix, Hulu, ESPN, Facebook, NBC, and Fox. All up, Jimmy's work has garnered him over 1 billion plus streams cumulatively. So how did this Jack, an arguably master of all trades, come to this point? Well, it begins in Atlanta, Georgia. Born as Maurice Eugene Willis, he was at Chelston High School. He picked up electric guitar and with it, the stage name Jimmy Cravity was born. Jimmy would play around Atlanta, opening for PJ Morton. And after playing at 99X's Unplugged in the Park, he caught the ear of Abu Tham, currently EVP Columbia Records and Kanye West former manager, also Akon's brother and partner. Now, signing a publishing deal with Blue Vision slash Convict Music, Jimmy began to write and co-write with other people. His rock EP, titled, self-titled, came out around this time and it was followed by his independent EP, Maverick, in 2012. During this period, Jimmy also joined Passion City Church in Atlanta. Yes, the one run by Louis and Shelley Giglio, that's the one. You see, for seven years, Jimmy partnered and served with the Giglios 
and Six Step Records as a songwriter, producer and performs leading worship on passion albums and conferences. You may even recognise his name from the song Surrender, which made its way onto Passion's 2016 album, Salvation's Tide is Rising. In 2013, Jimmy and his family faced a heart-wrenching moment when their two-and-a-half-year-old son, Britton, was diagnosed with liver cancer. He passed and went to heaven. But even as he went through that, praying for healing, it would create new songs within him that would eventually make their way onto his Heaven EP. Now, before this EP was released, Jimmy was signed with Boo Vision, and he befriended Sharma Joseph, who had worked with the likes of Rihanna, Jay-Z, Kanye, Lecrae, and Andy Minio. With a mutual desire to create a gospel album, they partnered to create the Heaven EP, which, as we know, also came from his experience in 2013. This EP was a forerunner to Kanye's Jesus is King, if ever there was one. Released on Six Steps and Capital CMG, the Heaven EP was a commercial success. The label debut reached 15 on the US Christian charts and 11 on the Heat Seekers charts. Meanwhile, the single Believe made it to the US Christian and the US Christian Airplay charts. It reached number four on the AC and CHR charts. And it was also noticed in contemporary Christian music, finally earning him two Dove nominations. Jimmy Cravity was now well and truly established and finally known in Christian music. Evangelical people knew his name and he would tour and open for Mercy Me, Natalie Grant and Jeremy Camp. He also supported our friend Crowder on the American Prodigal Tour. His tenure at Capital CMG made a way for a deal with Ethiopia Had to Mariam at UMPG and with Bill Hearn, Capital CMG chairman, enabling his songs Ain't Thinking About You and Time to be licensed for television. You may have heard them on Fox on Hulu. Jimmy would also work with artists including Estelle, Michelle Williams and Jordan Sparks during this period. After the success of this EP, Jimmy parted ways with Six Steps and Capital CMG Records. He created his own label called The Outlier Agency in 2021. He collaborated with Tasha Cobbs Leonard on the number one single, You Know My Name, and he was a featured artist on it. It reached number one on the Billboard Gospel streaming chart for nearly two years. That's right, I said years. It garnered his first RIAA certification gold. He went on to contribute to Face City Music's 2022 album, which debuted at one on the iTunes Christian and Gospel charts. But as we know, Jimmy's creativity can't be contained to just one industry or audience. And he also garnered his first RIAA Platinum certification as a contributor on Dead Man Walking by Brent Fayez, which featured on the number one album Wasteland on the R&B hip hop album Billboard charts. That album also reached number two on the Billboard Hot 200. So, where does that leave Jimmy Cravity in 2023? After collaborating with Matt Redman on the single The Last Amen and releasing his single poetry, his Christian album, The Last Amen, same title, was unleashed on May 26th, last week. This album is an exploration of the Christian imagination, and Jimmy uses his exquisite musicianship and creativity to invite the listener to experience God in a whole new way. The worship album focuses on the pillars of the Christian faith. I spoke to Jimmy about being like Jesus in the writer's room, the artistry of God, and living for Jesus outside of the Christian music industry. Friends, it is my privilege to invite you to meet the one and only Jimmy Cravity. Jimmy Cravity, welcome to Between You and Me and Jesus Wide. How are you going? Jessa, Jessica, thank you so much for having me. I'm going well. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, I am so delighted to chat with you. You are, okay, I was reading your bio, producer, songwriter, designer, you own your own record label. There are a million titles that we could use to describe you, but in your own words, who is Jimmy Cravity? Well, I would say I am just a uh, renaissance man. Uh, There's a saying in the US that uh, jack of all trades a master of none, but a jack of all trades is better than a master of one. Um, so I would say uh, range, a ranger, uh, a creative, uh, an entrepreneur. Yeah, perfect. So in the midst of all this, I know that you've been part of the music industry in various contexts for many years, and your album is coming out May 26. So as we record yes. the end of this month, the last amen, I've already had a listen to it and it's beautiful and powerful and it sounds in the best way slightly different from what I normally expect from Christian worship music, which makes me really excited 
I really love that. Can you tell me about this project? Why is it called The Last Amen? Well, uh, it's called The Last Amen based on a title track there. Um, Revelations 3, Jesus is talking to the church and he says, I am the beginning and the end. I'm the faithful and true witness. I am the amen. Some translations say the final amen. Um, And I've been thinking about uh, a year and a half ago, I went to Orange County and wrote a song with Matt Redman. We wrote two songs off the album, Battle and Blessing and The Last Amen. And I've always thought that's such a strong concept, such a strong theme, uh, talking about the supremacy of Christ in all things and how he has preeminence above everything. And so uh, when I think about The Last Amen, I think about the immortality, uh, the eternal nature of Christ, the sovereignty of Christ, the the finality of who he is. And so the album is called The Last Amen because I felt like that was the strongest title. Um, and I feel like it makes a statement. Um, and I feel like it's, it's pretty uh, comparable to the music. You know, the music makes a statement as well. And I feel like, uh, you know, The Last Amen is so fitting for it. Yeah, absolutely. So as you were going in to create this album, I'm, you know, you, you've created you've created Christian music albums before. You've created quote unquote secular music, however you want to define that. But you've you've sort of you've released a series of albums. Why did you choose to go the worship genre? Granted, like your own iteration of it, but why did you choose this genre for this album? Well, I, I've been thinking about that for a while. Um, I've been a believer for since I was a teenager. Uh, when I started writing songs, I started writing songs for uh, the mainstream, and I also started writing songs for the church as well. As a believer, I feel a strong calling to uh, use my gifts and talents to help build God's church, and so um, I wanted to do that with this album. Uh, I've made a couple albums now that have been more faith based, faith focused, highlighting my. Uh, spiritual journey. And so I wanted to share, I wanted to create a soundtrack for my spiritual journey and hopefully it could resonate with others and be a soundtrack for their spiritual journey as well. There's an eye, there's an eye to see Where there's a mind, there's a mind to believe Give me the light I'll drown them all in the sea If you raise the faith Raise the faith to believe Give me something of the wonder Give me something of the magnificence of you Yes, I can see it in the love talk a little bit about the Christian imagination on this album um, and the imagery that we find in Revelations. I would love to know how you sort of entered into this this idea of the Christian imagination and how has it grown your faith and your relationship with God? Well, actually, now you're stepping into the future a little bit, but this is a great question. Um, I feel like the music that I will make as it relates to spirituality, I would like it to be an exploration in Christian imagination. Uh, We have the Word of God, which is final, which is elevated, which is uh, more valuable than any GDP of any economy. The Word of God is more powerful and more valuable than trillions of dollars. We couldn't put a dollar value on it. And so we have the word, uh, but peering into the word by the spirit, I feel like uh, there are opportunities for it to explore in Christian imagination. Uh, For example, and this is going even into the future of what is to come. um, I've been thinking about different ideas. Uh, You know, Jesus is talking to Peter uh, and Peter says, if it's you, let me come out on the water. And Jesus bids him come out on the water. And 
I believe that Jesus was a ways away from the boat. Uh, maybe, maybe let's say a hundred steps. And Peter's walking out a hundred steps to Jesus. And uh, you know how the story goes. He takes his eyes off, he falls, and Christ lifts him up. And I think about Christian imagination. What happens on the walk back to the boat? Do they walk back together? And this idea, there's a, there's a song on my album called Waters. And the lyrics are, I have come through the waters with Christ. I have come through the waters with God. I have come through the waters of life and the old man I am not. I think about that in terms of the walk back with Peter. Uh, and so that's just one uh, exploration in Christian imagination. But I think the spirit of God, the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead gives life to us. And I believe that that spirit should give life to our imaginations as well in a way that's consistent, obviously, with scripture. And but I think it there's uh, there's so much to explore uh, within the pages. No, I love that. And well, some of the best art comes from well, and some of the best Christian art comes from Christian imagination done really well, um, which was what we see with your album. I th- I was listening. I liked all the tracks, but particularly the song poetry really stood out to me. It was just fun from what could be like a really deep and interesting topic anyway about coming to, I I imagine it as like the table of God or coming to God even, and you talk about a bittersweet love. And I would love to know more about, for you, what does that mean? What does it mean to come to God and also in light of that to come to his people and know that this, his love is perfect, but we experience it because we're in a broken world. So what does poetry mean to you in light of all that? Oh, that's great. I think for me in writing that song, it was uh, exploring what would the soundtrack be for the prodigal son to come back home. Uh, and I think it should be fun. And I also think the the table of God, when you talk about the table of God, it's always open. It's not closed, you know, and so there's uh, there's this invitation to the heights, you know. I, I feel like communion, communing with God is an invitation to the heights. Fellowshipping with God is, a, is an invitation to the heights. And so in poetry, uh, specifically, I thought about, okay, what would, should it feel like? What would it sound like if I were writing music to this story? Uh, the story of a son, you talk about the bittersweet part of it. You know, you normally get an inheritance when your folks pass away. And he wanted it beforehand. And I had to, I imagine that was probably bittersweet for his for his father, uh, for him to say, you know, you're worth more to me dead than alive, essentially. Um, but but to to see the grace, you know, if love wasn't broken, why would you have to try? Now you're dying to fix it, staring down those teary eyes. You know, you come to this realization that sometimes the things that you wanted are not as great as the things that you thought they would be, you know. Um, And I could see that within the story there. And so the invitation to the table of God is so open uh, to all. And I feel like that as it relates to the spiritual life, it should always be frontier and it should be a celebration uh a real diving into the depths of gratitude, you know, to help us along the way. All you lovers and friends, come in, come in. Have a seat out there and have some bread. If love wasn't broken, then why'd you have to try? Now you're dying to fix it, staring down those teary eyes. This love is poetry, sweat and sweet symphony of poetry. Yeah, this love is poetry. For me, it came for me, it's poetry. Yeah, this love is poetry. Sweat and sweet symphony of poetry. 
How do you see your art in all its facets? Like, nearly, I don't want to say preparing a table of God because we know that's what God does and the Holy Spirit does, but nearly like making space for people to come and enter into, into who God is because your art crosses so, so, I would say, so many barriers, even, even the Christian industry, it crosses so many things so beautifully. What does your art mean for you in preparing a place for people to come? That's that's the hope, you know. That's the hope. Um, uh, my sister-in-law, I'll f- never forget this. Maybe about four or five years ago, I was playing in a concert, and she said, uh, "Whenever you play music, I just feel peace." And it wasn't about I wasn't playing necessarily, you know, Lord and Christ, or you know, something along those lines. But I feel that. Um, Music is a gift from God. I feel it's a real gift from Him, and and we as His sons and daughters can use it in ways that help build and inspire humanity. And there's something about the our design that deep calls out to deep, from oil to oil. Even in terms of the music, it's not necessarily you know it it doesn't have to be so. Um, this, this album is unapologetically about Jesus Christ. Uh, but if I were making a hip hop album, um, you know, you, there would still be that same deep calling out to deep. And that's my, been my hope. I hope to make music that's timeless and that connects with all people, regardless of where they stand in their relationship with Christ. But the hope is that they would find that light, that they would find that, um, yearning that they will find that answer to what they're looking for. And sometimes that takes time and creating a space for it, I think, you know. If mercy is an ocean Let it break over me Every wave or waterfall Brings my sin out to sea Grace after grace after grace My life has been grace after grace after grace Love without end Spirit, my power Breathes wind in my cells The cross is my compass And your love never fails Oh, grace After grace After grace My life has been Grace After grace After grace Love without end. Knowing that you're based in California, um, which I think in, I'm just thinking in comparison with Nashville, which is I sort of think Nashville, hub of Christian music, California, so much more going on in terms of genres. Oh, Christian and and country, and we've got everything else going on in LA and that area, um, which you can sort of see comes in and your your time in Atlanta, you can sort of see all of those factors come into the sound of your music and how you create it. Um, I know that you've worked with such a wide range of artists, like amazing, really well notable Christian artists as well as like hip-hop artists and people that I think people in probably like the evangelical church, often we would be like, uh, can't go near that. Or, or like, you're nearly like one or the other. What I love about what you do is you're like, good art is good art and God is everywhere. What does it look like to embody Jesus in your everyday, whether you're working in a Christian album or you're helping produce a hip hop album? Mm-hmm. 
I think um, a part of it is embodying Jesus means holding on to this verse. Uh, I believe it's in Colossians that says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not for men. And I think about that in terms of, um, you know, everyone, I think about this. I've been thinking about this for the past like few months. Everyone that makes music is making music about what they believe in, you know, and, and not everyone believes in God. Not everyone believes in Christ. And, um, but those that do, um, there's a way to to do that in a way that doesn't feel ultimately so polarizing um, and so, um, you know, kind of self-righteous to where there is no communion, there is no community. Um, and so what I try to do is I try to let the scriptures um, inform my belief system inform how I live. And I try to work heartily as unto the Lord. And I try to do my best in music. And I think embodying Jesus, uh, Jesus welcomed everyone in. Uh, there wasn't, uh, there were people that probably in this day, if we had the same types of people that Jesus uh, hung out with, so a lot of the evangelical community would probably not be pleased with hanging out with them, but that was Jesus's prerogative. And also, you know, I think it's so important to note that Jesus wasn't a Christian, you know, and that he was a Jew and he was Jewish and the Jews were looking for a Messiah, you know? And so it's this idea that, uh, you know, we build so many things, uh, even in terms of the Jewish religion as well. You know, the Jews built the the Torah. They have the Torah. And then there are all of these laws and customs that keep you from even coming close to where you shouldn't be, you know. And I think about that in relation to our conduct and behavior and how we live. Uh, Christ did not come to abolish, but to fulfill and I think he showed us the way in terms of how we are to go about life, uh, welcoming in those ones that we think are strangers, you know. And I think uh, I think Jesus gives us a great example, and I'm I'm trying to follow his example. I'm not always perfect in that, um, and and no one is perfect, uh, but trying to follow his example and lead a life that's similar to his. I find inspiration in that. Yeah. I completely different life, totally resonate with that. None of us are doing it perfectly, but just the every day, just following, loving, and uh, also love the continual challenge for myself not to read the Bible through Western eyes, <laughs> remembering who Jesus was, the culture he was mm-hmm. in. Always, always mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, now, I, I have some hopefully slightly like, fun questions for you, just random questions. Yeah. However, before I get to uh-huh. them, is there anything else you'd like to say about your record, The Last Amen? Is there any particular songs you want people to go sure, and listen to? Sure, I want to just highlight, I'm so excited. Um, I wrote two songs with Matt Redman on this album, The Battle and Blessing and The Last Amen, and he was so gracious to join me on The Last Amen, singing on the song as well. And so I want to just say thank you to him and thank you to all of the collaborators on it. Paul Duncan, Jason Ingram, um, uh, Chase uh, Weber, who mixed it, and uh, Connor Shambrook, who did a bunch of the BGVs and a lot of the people that helped uh, make it come to life. I'm really thankful for that. My hope with the last statement is that it would encourage others on their spiritual journey uh, to grow deeper in their connection and communion with God. And so I'm excited for it to come out. Go and check it out everywhere. And if you like it, share it with others. At the end of the age One name still standing Jesus 
Jesus, you will remain. You're the everlasting, faithful and true God through and through. Faithful and true. You are the star. questions that someone might ask you on the streets or I might just ask you because I feel like it. Number one, what is your favourite music album of all time? Wow. Favourite music album of all time. Okay, I'm going to just go with the one that I have probably played the most straight through. Coldplay, A Rush of Blood to the Head. Good choice. Love that. Yeah. And you answered so quickly. Most people are like, can I give you five? And I say, sure, who am I to make you choose one? So yeah, that was great. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the one I play the most. And and I have other some other notable mentions. Um, but yeah, I think that I think I played that one the most out of all. Okay. So you have worked with quite a few people. Who is still on your wish list? What is your dream collaboration, living or dead? Wow, okay. I'm gonna go with both. I'm going to do what people do on the first one here. Uh, dream, collaboration, um, uh, dead, I would say, uh, Otis Redding. Oh, yeah. I would love to collaborate with Otis Redding. And now living, um, so funny. I was actually just talking to some friends about this the other day, and now the person is escaping me. Um, <laughs> Bono, you two, oh, yes. you two, dream collaboration, you two, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know Bono, but Bono, make it happen. Thank you. People yeah. who know him, make it happen. <laughs> yeah, let's go. That'd let's go. Awesome. Okay, and my last question for you before we wrap this up. If you could go back to the day before you started recording your first solo project, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now? Hmm. Um, I would say put it out faster. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Don't, yes. don't be so precious about it. Seth Godin, the incredible marketer, says that if it's – and if it's perfect, you ship too late. <laughs> I confess Jesus Christ Son of the living God I confess Jesus' name with power alone to say. There's something so cool for me when I meet an artist who doesn't just put themselves in one industry. Please don't think I'm saying that 
people shouldn't just stick to one industry. I know there are people who are called to one thing or it's like their career isn't that. That's cool. But there's something so unique when in the Christian industry you meet someone who sort of straddles a line between multiple places um, and it comes – it's, it, I don't imagine it's an easy an easy line to walk because you're living out your faith every day, but with possibly two cultures that don't necessarily always mesh, or with two audiences or powerful people at play that wouldn't necessarily want you to be associated with the other one. Now I don't know all that for sure, but I just imagine that it would be incredibly difficult. But also, if that was like what you're called to do and what you're passionate about, what an incredible privilege and. Jimmy Cravity is one of those people who just seems to be a light bearer, both in Christian music and outside of Christian music. He is just in music and he works with people and he bees like Jesus in that. And he just happened to create a worship album. That's really cool. I love that. I love that he's not afraid to push the envelope and the barrier of what we try to compartmentalize people and artists into in any industry. He keeps pushing it out and says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this. I love that. I think it's really, really cool. I would love to see more and more artists cross cross industries like that. I mean, we're beginning to see it in some ways. And there are people who have been doing that for years, right? I even think of Burlap to Kashmir back in the late 90s. But there's something that's so there's something so cool for me, and I use the word sacred, something so sacred when you get a merging of these two worlds. The other the other week, I was watching a video of the Jonas Brothers on SNL. Now, a lot of you guys know I love the Jonas Brothers from way back. I was a, I'm a Disney kid, but um, as we know, like the Jonas Brothers are not a Christian band. They grew up in the church. They were pastors' kids. Um, their documentary is fascinating. You sort of see the pressure they felt when they were first signed and everything. But I bring this up because. The Jonas Brothers now perform on SNL and they don't talk about faith much now, but they're certainly some of the parts of their music and and what they've appeared in now certainly wouldn't meld with like Christian culture, right? However, they've collaborated with Kirk Franklin and they've also collaborated with John Bellion, who was also a former church kid, who has made it like big, rightly so, in music, they've collaborated to create a song called Walls. And if you watch this snippet of of the song on SNL, there's a gospel choir behind them, but you can like, you get tingles, you feel God's spirit there. And yeah, you go, that's musicianship. That's really good musicianship because it creates an emotion in you. But there's something for me that was incredibly cool about Kirk Franklin, who's like a stalwart in gospel music. And then you have these these guys, these men now, who survived purity culture and they were the pin-up boys in purity culture, even if they didn't want to be. And then you have John Bellion, who has grown up with a faith but has then reassessed publicly his identity. And you have a collaboration between all these creative people and their stories to create something profound. And in that, I, I couldn't tell you about any of their faiths individually. I don't know any of them. But it was a cool moment of seeing how God can paint people in the middle of their stories to create something stunning. And uh, I see God doing things like that with Jimmy Cravity because he's not afraid to step into the dark places or maybe the unfamiliar places where so many of us who were in the church, uh, where we're not accustomed to go into them or we're not equipped to go into them or it's just not our wheelhouse. But this is Jimmy's wheelhouse. I love that. I love the authority he carries in that area. And I love the fact that he is offering something so beautiful to the church with this worship album. Thank you, Jimmy, for this. Thank you for being honest with me, for sharing with me. It was such a delight to connect with you. Friends, you can connect with Jimmy Cravity right now. You'll find him on Instagram at I am Jimmy Cravity, and you will find his website at jimmycravity.com. I'm going to spell that for you. J-I-M-I-C-R-A-V-I-T-Y. Those links are in the show notes. You can also buy, stream, love, The Last Amen and all of its singles now on all major streaming platforms. Again, all those links are in the show notes, as well as a title of all the songs that we played in this episode so that you can go listen to them again. What a delight. What a delight. Uh, I just, I love it when, when interviews like this pop into my inbox. I know I get excited about every interview. You guys know how passionate I am about hearing stories, but when they when they cross the border of like evangelical culture and step into something else, oh, there is so much meat there. There's so much goodness and there's so much complexity. 
I love that. I thrive on that. I want to do more of that for you in the future. But, (laughs) and we will do this more in the future, but next week, next week, we are jumping way over into the worship genre. Well, I mean, Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy is in the worship genre. So let's be clear. It's not that over out, like outside the box, but next week I am talking to, you could say an upcoming worship artist collective, but really they're pretty well established. The name is Stockholm Worship. And they are the expression of Hillsong Church in Sweden. And it was fascinating, guys. It was fascinating. I had a great conversation with Eric, who is like their their creative pastor there. He co-wrote Cornerstone, like mind blown right there. And you know what the best part of the interview was? I didn't even have to ask him about the uproar and the media and the thoughts and the chaos happening in Hillsong right now. He brought it up himself very respectfully. And I was able to lean into that and ask him about how his community were processing that, how his friends were processing that. For me, it was just like a a more human interaction about something that is very big and that rightly needs to be talked about. But it was really cool to meet someone and hear about how this impacts a local community, knowing that this guy, even though he represents this position, is part of his local church. I can't wait for you to hear it. So make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Between You and Me podcast, on any podcast platform. While you're there, and I say it every time, would you please go and give us a rating? It helps people to find us, and we love that. Meanwhile, you can find us on social media at Between You and Me pod, and we are online at Between You and Me podcast. Have I also mentioned that we have merch? We do have merch. The links are in our show notes or on our website. And we have fun stuff there. Logo tees, icons tee. Our latest one is Jackie Velasquez, who was the queen of like Latin Christian music in the thousands and late nineties. Someone I should probably ask to be on the podcast. Never have. But hey, if you know, if Jackie, if you're out there, we'd love to talk to you. Side note, that's all I've got. Friends, thank you for listening to this podcast. I cannot wait for you to hear my conversation next week with Stockholm Worship. Here's to hope. They say you're only as good as your last success and failure's not an option. Maybe that's why I'm exhausted. Held so tight to their applause that when it stopped, I thought that yours were too Till you said that my heart to you is worth everything Ooh. Don't gotta be somebody when I'm already somebody to you Got nothing to prove anymore So there's nothing to lose anymore You're gonna keep on loving me for more than just the things that I do I'll sing it till there's no doubt Nobody can count me out Cause I'm already somebody to you My heart
be somebody when I'm already somebody to you Got nothing to prove anymore There's nothing to lose anymore You're gonna keep on loving me 